Okay, I'd like to introduce the next speaker. And before I do, I would like to take an opportunity to thank Julia for all the organization she's done one more time, just because I have her up here. So anyway, thank you. And with that, there's her talk. Thank you. So, so you kindly thank me. I would like to thank all of you for making for coming and for making it very easy to organize this event. And so, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so this is a little bit maybe far afield from what I did as a student here. Um, I think in some sense, maybe in my mind it's a thanks to Dan and to other people with whom I studied um, during my years of study um, for teaching me many things which enabled me to go on and do many other things, different things afterwards. I mean, I, I really appreciate the foundation and the ability to look at new problems and the combination, I think, which is very important of the combination of experimenting with things and thinking about things and constructing hypotheses and drawing conclusions and testing those hypotheses. Especially, test, I think, testing hypotheses by actually writing programs and doing things is, is maybe, in some sense, my strongest association with them. Thank you very much. Um, so the topic of this talk is, or basically the top topic of my current research is on um, using programming language techniques to improve the uh, improve operating systems, improve the ability to interact with operating systems. So, so we're looking at uh, process scheduling uh, at the moment, and some other, we've looked at some other similar. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Francoise Lemo and uh, Jim Lemo. So the problem setting that we're considering in this talk is process scheduling. So process scheduling is an old problem, um, but there's no single perfect process scheduler. So you're probably familiar with some algorithms if you took uh, some operating systems course, uh, perhaps as in my case with Chris Haynes. Um, we have round robin variants of round robin scheduling for interactive processes. We have a set of processes. You go around to each of them. Uh, you give them each a little bit of time and give them the illusion of um, having one nth of the CPU. Uh, so there's variants of this algorithm in operating systems we use every day. There's also more exotic variants of this for particular kinds of applications. Um, this gives good behavior for some kinds of things. Um, but a, a weakness of it is that it doesn't give any guarantees about how much processor time in a particular time interval process actually gets. Because that depends on how many other processes you're sharing the processor with. Um, so for some applications that's unacceptable. So there have been other kinds of scheduling algorithms, earliest deadline first, rate monotonic, and so on, which give a process guarantees about how much CPU time it's going to get. On the other hand, these are more demanding of the user. The user needs to give the operating system more information so that it can ensure that these guarantees can be respected. So these two kinds of algorithms are targeting different um, kinds of applications. <coughs> there are other more exotic algorithms that target other more specific needs. Okay, so the idea is that there are many different kinds of scheduling algorithms there are that target different kinds of applications with different properties. The problem, though, is that if you look at your operating system on your computer, whichever one it happens to be, um, it's only going to give you basically one algorithm. It might give you some flags, and you can sort of switch between multiple algorithms. But there's a very, very limited selection. So what we would like to do is we would like to make it um, both easy and safe for application programmers, that is, the people who are writing the application who actually know what scheduling kind of scheduling proper cities are needed, um, in order to write schedulers at the kernel level. Okay, so basically the two key words are easy and safe. Um, to make it easy, we're going to introduce a domain-specific language, which is called BOSA, um, which provides appropriate abstractions that make it easy to write a process scheduler. For the safety part, we're going to propose a type system, basically a system of pre- and post-conditions, actually, um, 
and we're going to use information about the semantics of the various constructs in the language in order to be able to um, check these constraints. Okay, so first I want to motivate this a little bit more concretely so we can think about um, what you would have to do if you were going to write a scheduling policy by yourself in Linux. Okay, so when I started to make this slide, I thought, okay, I'll take some real Linux code, I'll put it in a really teeny tiny font, and they'll be impressed by how complicated it is. <laughs> but unfortunately, that didn't work. I couldn't figure out how to make teeny enough font that all of the code that was quite required would actually fit on the slide. <laughs> um, so if we think about the most fundamental part, which is how we pick a process, the process scheduling is most fundamentally about how you pick the next process to run on the CPU. Um, so if we, if we just consider that part, we already have almost 250 lines of code to look through, and they are appear in nine different functions in macros. So basically you have this big block of code, you want, it's implementing some scheduling algorithm, you want to figure out what parts of that code need to be modified, removed, added, and so on um, in order to implement your scheduling algorithm. Um, so there's already a lot of code you have to understand. In this particular case, that code does some things related to choosing a process. It also performs a context switch, so you have to distinguish between those two different kinds of operations, um, and so on. You also have to just picking the process is not, a, is not good enough. You have to be aware of other things. And this might not um, be obvious in the beginning, but uh, you have to think about when processes are created, what are you going to do with them? Processes that are created are new candidates for being scheduled. Processes that terminate, they're no longer candidates for being scheduled. The processes block and unblock, and when time goes by, you might want to react to those things in different ways. So we end up with a very large number of uh, lines of code that we have to study in a large number of functions in a large number of different files and um, there's not some nice little book that says okay if you want to change the scheduling algorithm Linux just go and change these lines here. Okay, so what we want to do is instead of um, thinking about the structure of Linux we want to think about the problem of scheduling at a more conceptual level. So basically, as I mentioned before, process scheduling, the problem we're addressing is how to select a new process to run on the CPU. Okay, so if we want to elect a new process. So you have a bunch of processes, and you want to pick one of them. But there's a small hitch, which is they're not, not all actually able to run. So then you have to start distinguishing between different kinds of processes. You have to distinguish between the ones that are able to run and the ones that are not able to run because they're waiting for I.O. or doing some other thing that would make them not able to do any useful computation. So we have this idea then of process states. Some things are in the ready state, some things are in the block state. There might be in other states as well. And we want to elect an eligible process that is, maybe we can think of that as one of the ones in the ready state. And we want to adjust the states of process in response to things that happen in the kernel so that when a, pr a process wants to read, then it's going to do certain things in the kernel, and our scheduling policy is going to have to react to that in some way. Okay, so, so we've designed the language based on those, um, basically the fundamental concepts, those two fundamental concepts, which are the idea of process states and the idea of reacting to kernel events. So for process states, um, this is a state declaration that you put at the beginning of your scheduling policy. So we have a number of states here, running, ready, expired, blocked, and terminated. We have these things over here, which are called state classes. They sort of describe the schedule, schedulability of processes in these states. Um, so it's sort of like domain-specific types, like integer or Boolean, except um, it says whether or not um, the processes here are able to um, be elected to the CPU. And then there's also some information about the implementation of these states. Um, so the interesting things are the state classes. So we have the running state, which is in the running state class. So it's a bit hard to distinguish between those things when I say them. But the one in the middle is a name that's chosen by the programmer. The one on the left, again, it's a fixed thing. It's going to let the um, tools for the language understand what the semantics of these different states are. Um, so those are the one running is the one that the process that's actually running right now. 
uh, ready and expired are both in the ready state class. The ready state class is processes that are able to run. The block state class is processes that are not able to run. And the terminated state class is processes that are terminated. Well, how come it doesn't have a little colon and then a black word next to it? <laughs> because we don't care about them anymore. What's the difference between a select queue and a queue? Okay. Um, the select queue are the ones that we actually pick processes from. There's a difference between processes that are able to run from the <coughs> point of view of the operating system and processes that we, the policy would actually like to have run. Um, and the select ones are the ones that are both able to run from the operating system and from the point of view of the policy. Um, I mean, you just have to use your intuition here from the names. Um, but the ready ones are the ones that we would like to run. The ones that are expired have used up their time slice. And so the policy is not interested in them anymore. Um, on the other hand, maybe the policy will run out of ready ones. And the fact that we're in the ready, the expired ones are in the ready state class means that we can pick from that if we like later. <coughs> okay, so that's one abstraction. The other abstraction are these event handlers. Um, so as I said before, there are various events that happen in the kernel, and the policy needs to react to them to maintain a consistent <coughs> view of um, the schedulability of each process. And it might need to ca compute some bookkeeping information as well. But the main point is to make these process state changes. Um, so here we have an event handler for unblocking. So the first thing is to test whether the process that we're trying to unblock actually is blocked. If it actually is blocked, then we're going to take it from its current state and to move it into the ready state. Unblocking means that the process is now able to run. It didn't used to be. And this is a preemptive variant of unblocking. And so if there's some running process, we want to move it out of the running state as well. <coughs> okay, so there's some, so I guess one thing I would like to, um, point I would like to make about it, there's no low level implementation details. And here we don't see anything about, um, I mean, as I, I pointed out over here, we have different implementations for the different, um, different states. Here we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have the same operators for the state transitions, and so the compiler takes care of implementing everything in the right way. There's also the point that might be a little bit surprising, which is the test of whether the target process is um, actually in the blocked state or not. You might assume that unblocking should always get a blocked process. Um, so this is a handler for Linux, and we'll see in a minute um, <coughs> that in Linux the target process is not always blocked. So the idea here is, for example, we have a little example down here at the bottom where we have some processes, and the kernel sends a event notification to the policy that says unblock process P2. So P2 is initially blocked. So it will move into the ready state. And then the running process will also move into the ready state. And we end up with that. <coughs> OK. Um, as I said before, the main thing about a scheduling policy is to elect, elect a new process. So that's uh, what this handler does. Uh, we have this idea of <coughs> their processes both in ready or the un sorry, the BOSA plan the BOSA um, dot schedule handler uh, is its goal is to take one of those processes that's able to run and move it into the ready state. So we had, as I mentioned before, we have the two states that it contain processes that are ready to run, and um, so this is doing the kind of favoring of the ready processes over the expired processes, as I mentioned before. But then ultimately, we have this function select. And the function select takes care of taking, picking the best process out of the state that was um, designated as select. And this is a typo, changing its state to run. And does select need to know which queue to operate on? Um, it knows that by the keyword select up here. You're only allowed 
to pick things from one particular state. Okay, so exactly one thing in black if there are fields that select. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us about the scope of that type of? Uh, yes, it would. Absolutely. So you're using the wrong uh, presentation software. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> uh, but the actual syntax is XML. Anyway. Sorry, what? The actual syntax is XML. Yes, so, so we have a, a language that makes it very easy to express only the uh, kinds of concepts we need for the scheduling policy. Of course, somebody has to implement this. We actually need to ultimately make some connection to the kernel. Uh, so we have the idea of a operating system expert, someone who's an expert in a particular operating system, and that person in the very beginning has to go through the kernel and insert these various event notifications, um, and then they're going to make the appropriate calls out to the policy. Okay, so now we come to safety. Okay, so again we're going to think about what we would what would happen if we tried to do the actual coding inside the kernel. Um, so things often go wrong when one writes a program the first time, for example. You might actually dereference a null pointer. You might mess up some of your pointer manipulation. My queues, the queues that are used are actually doubly linked lists, so you've got four pointer manipulations. You could do some of them improperly. Um, you might do process state changes like the typo that I made in the previous slide. The problem with these things is that if, when you're programming at the kernel level, they mostly have catastrophic results. Uh, null pointer dereference, your kernel will crash. Uh, pointer problems, your kernel might crash. Or you might hook things up in the wrong way, and then you end up with something inconsistent. You might have a process that just disappears. You never see it again. You don't realize that it's not there anymore. The time when you detect the error is not very connected to the time when the error actually occurred. Here again, you can have the kernel hanging in this way. Uh, it's very hard to get any kind of postmortem information when you're working at the kernel level. So in our case, some of these errors just can't occur because of the use of the domain-specific language. So incorrect pointer inf implementation, uh, manipulation, the language compiler just makes things in the right way, does all the checks that are necessary. Um, some of these other cases, though, require some input from the expert in the operating system. I mentioned before about um, how Linux has to be this peculiarity of a process that unblocks might not actually be blocked. Um, so that's not really something we want to build into the language, because that's just the peculiarity of Linux. Windows might work differently. So we're going to have some auxiliary information from the expert in the operating system. So an operating system is a big and complicated thing. We need to wonder whether the properties that we need um, can be expressed in a concise and understandable way. Um, and then can our tools use this information? Can we use it to detect errors? Can we use it to improve the results of compilation? Okay, so this is the System declarations that we have developed for BOSA has this information. Um, it has just a list of the events that are supposed to be defined because that, again, is um, completely specific to the operating system. A list of the ones that occur in interrupts. So interrupts are something that complicate um, OS programming significantly. Um, a list of the sequences that can occur. And then the most important things are these type rules. So this goes with Matthias's question about would your system have detected this error? Um, so basically we have a description of <coughs> the configuration of process states that can occur when we start running the event handler <coughs> and the configuration of process states that we're supposed to have at the end of the event handler. So it would have detected the error ahead before because the BOSA.schedule event is supposed to put some process in the running state and the way it was written before it didn't. Um, <coughs> so what this is saying is that these are types for, these are types for Linux, and in Linux, um, the, the process that's unblocking might be blocked, in which case we should put it in a ready state. We also have the opportunity to unblock, sorry, to preempt the running process 
if the process is already running or already ready, then nothing should happen at all. So, um, so these these types uh, can be used. They are used in verification to detect the kind of error that we talked about just before. It's also used in um, compilation because this gives us some information about the context in which each of the handlers is called. In general, the handlers is a very small amount of code. You can't really do any kind of interprocedural inter analysis from just the handlers themselves. Um, so this gives some information about the context and we can generate better code in that way. Okay, so in general, the architecture that we have is um, we have this two-stage process where the expert in a particular operating system configures the operating system and um, creates the set of type rules that are appropriate to his configuration of the system. We do some checking that those types of type rules are consistent. And then we have a fixed verifier and compiler. And those fixed verifier and compiler are configured with this information. And now um, they can be used for any um, policy. And the policy, we then we end up with a dynamically loading, loadable module. So you can just um, write your policy and test it without rebooting the system. So. Okay, so the point is that um, programming using the specific language lets us um, modify uh, code in the kernel in an easy and safe way. So a little anecdote, this has been used in teaching several undergraduate courses, and so far no student has managed to crash the operating system during the class. So. Good performance as well. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so so a secret about operating systems code is there, or at least in scheduling, there are um, a lot of other things that take time. And so using a domain specific language and having this modular this modular thing off to the side, not integrated inline to optimize into the kernel. It adds a little bit of overhead, but it's not an overhead that you would actually be able to detect in real in real applications. Um, so we can do things in a clean way and we can also get good performance. So, okay, now I'm done. Thank you. application had a lot of threads, but I do this with the threads within my app, or if I wanted to talk about all the processes running on one computer, would I be doing a, a policy? Who's writing policies? And what's their scope? Um, so, I mean, the interest of doing something at the kernel level is to be able to describe your interaction with the rest of the world. If you are um, just scheduling your own threads, then maybe you could just do that at the user level. Um, or maybe if you wanted better performance, then you could make a policy in the internal level, uh, sorry, the kernel level. One thing that we let you do is you can create a hierarchy of schedulers. And so you could make a special scheduler for your threads, and you could put yourself under that scheduler. Um, and then you would have to describe how you should relate to all the other processes. Should you have higher priority than them? Or should you share the CPU with them? Do you get to give yourself 60% of the CPU and everybody else 40% of the CPU and so on? So that sort of ties into the question, the next question I was wondering was this, can I write a policy that doesn't terminate? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's, I mean, you trust, you're sort of trusting policies, but you want to help me not make bugs. It's not like you think I'm hostile. What we, yeah, we don't think you're hostile. Um, we, uh, what we want to help you with is to interact properly with the operating system. Um, so we're trusting you or we're trusting the person we're thinking of a situation where you go to a textbook or a paper or something like that, you see a great scheduling algorithm for your problem, and you know that this algorithm has good properties in the sense that your algorithm wants. Now you want to take that and make it work under Linux. Okay, so it's going to be harder to find exactly what you should do to make it work under Linux, so we're helping you with that part. Sure. Could you talk a little bit about your type verifier? You mentioned briefly about consistency checks. What are they, and what is there a notion of completeness as well? I mean, do you look for missing rules and sort of thing? Um, I'm the, at the current 
current state of things, these are the things that you are allowed to do. For uh, this, these are things that an unblocked preemptive handler is allowed to do. Um, it's not saying that you have to implement. Well, uh, yeah, okay, you have to. What, the way it works is it thinks about each of these input configurations, and then it analyzes your code and it checks that the result is consistent with one of these rules. Okay. Okay, but this is not not going to ensure that it implements all of these rules. For example, we can start out with um, something in this configuration here, the one that's describing preemption, and um, you could only take the target process and only unblock it that will match this rule, and it would say, okay, so you could write a unblock preemptive handler that never does preemption. So, I don't know, I'm talking with someone who's interested in a more rich form of logic that might be able to both allow you and force you to preempt. You tried um, doing like part real time uh, programming with also. So we're looking, we have a student who is porting it to the Chorus operating system, or Jaluna operating system. Um, so we'll be looking at that. Sure. If you could as you follow up on all that question, mm -hmm. I consider using a strongly evaluating programming language. Uh, what's a strongly evaluated? Well, all the evaluation determinant. So that you can't find the opinion. You can use strongly normalized. No, strongly evaluating. Okay, I mean, I mean, no, the language, the, the individual I'm handlers. I'm going to teach you that one back there. The, indivi <laughs> the individual handlers have to terminate. No, no, but all it asked was that you write schedulers that can diverge. You said yes. Okay, what I meant, may, perhaps I didn't answer the question the right way then. Um, the, the individual handlers will always terminate. We only have bounded loops. We don't have recursion, and so on. That's on the right, other right, hand, right, on the other hand, the um, this, the scheduler will happily allow, for example, one process to take over the operating system to just run forever, and and we don't disallow that because sometimes that's a desirable behavior. You may want unfairness. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. This is no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was sort of answering, answering a different, different question. I also wanted to follow up on your question. So, um, I mean, we allow you to write real-time scheduling policies, but we don't magically turn your normal kernel into a real uh, If you do reference, I mean, I think, actually, I don't know the details, but it explicitly does that. I mean, it explicitly tests for that case and gives an error. Okay, I was just going to say the next version of this you sort forward and uh, you already have a name for it, right? The uh, Bossa Nova. <laughs> uh, yes, actually, this, this is actually the case, and um, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear your groans because uh, that's the next paper we're working on. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you a follow up question on this type system. Mm -hmm. when, I see, when I see a type system, the first thing you think about a type system, what, what quantity of the type system meant guarantees, or you make these negative predictions about what can. If it types, then these things can't happen. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't actually have a type system. What you've got is this framework that lets each person, each wizard, define a type system. Mm -hmm. right? And then you have this meta thing that maybe lets you see if the type system fits together and lets you make predictions. Mm -hmm. But what I was wondering was, can you can you take, does your tool let you take like that type system, or the type system that Robbie comes up with next week for his little policy set and, and figure out what the guarantees are. Is there a guarantee you get to make or type systems and guarantees, you know, they go together. So what are the guarantees for? Um I'm not I, yeah, I shouldn't make, try to answer you. I don't know. <laughs> I never understand your questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So there are some properties that you can prove based on um, where we have these sequences of events and we have this description, abstract description of certain behaviors that the handlers can exhibit. And so you can do some kind of interprocedural reasoning. Also, if you know certain things about how the operating system works and maybe draw some conclusions about certain kinds of policies. And, and some, it might work well for this operating system, might not work so well for Robbie's operating system. Um, I don't know. Is it, is it possible that we do really have not so much a type system, but a type state system? Mm -hmm. 
where you actually try to encode file states like, you know, you very simply say that everybody has the open the file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's a similar thing. And that's really more of a sequential uh, contracting system yeah. than a yeah. Okay. Okay, so we will now move on. Okay, thank you.